Sally Morgan believes that not only can everyone sing with ease, but that we can all speak in passionate, empowered ways that engage in growth, captivate, and convince, and even more important, that we can do that with ease too. And when I discovered that Sally's approach to vocal training is pretty much the same as my approach to creativity, well, I was hooked. So the first question I want to ask, and you, and you do address this in your webinars, and I'm sure you address this a lot, is why is everyone so scared to speak in public? Well, I, usually I address this by beginning with what Jerry Seinfeld says. And he says that the, the number one fear of people worldwide is public speaking, an even greater fear than death. So that means that most people would rather be the guy in the casket than the one giving the eulogy. Now, well, and that, that, yeah, it's, that's pretty significant. That is pretty it significant. It is. And, and I'm wondering what it is about our voices um, or using our voices, perhaps in an empowered or public way, that, in, that, you know, that instills so much terror in people. Well... It, I don't have a definitive answer except to say that the anxiety begins way before someone gets up to speak. And during that period of anxiety, there's this voice in your head that is telling you how badly you are going to mess up. And we had a little chat about this before we started, right? And mm -hmm. so that voice becomes so powerful. What, why are you speaking? Nobody wants to hear what you have to say. It's that kind of message that we get from our own brain that then we try to turn it into a reality whether we want to or not. And it, when you speak in public, it's like you're naked. You are vulnerable. And that vulnerability strikes fear in the hearts of most people. And so then stage fright is really what it is. That takes over. Stage fright is simply adrenaline run amok in your body. And it affects your physiology. It affects your heart rate, uh, the rate at which you breathe. And then it crawls into your brain and short circuits everything. So it's, that's, it's, that's it's a pretty, so pretty horrible thing. It's so and interesting because be. apart from the fact that you're doing it in public, uh, it's, those are very much the same kinds of fears that strike, well, that, that strike terror into the heart of, of writers uh, when they sit down absolutely. to a blank page. Oh, absolutely, because the page is, yes, it's blank. And it's up to you to fill that page. But I know that you coach people to go inside of themselves, to tap into that power that we all have that is an individual power, but it's also a creative power. And when I am working with speakers, I do that exact same thing. We take you to your power center, and everybody has one. Even if you ask a small child, do you know that you have a place inside of you that's really, really strong? And they'll say, yes. And then you say, well, do you ever use that? And they'll say, oh, no. <laughs> like that might be a bad thing to use that power. And that we carry into adulthood. We know so we have that power. There. We know we have the creativity. All over the, but we haven't been given permission to use it. Right, or haven't given ourselves permission, which is, I guess, the, the what really is happening well, in the end. Yeah, at this at this point in the game, you have to give yourself that permission. Um, and I'm speaking of those of us who have gone through a lifetime overcoming this in one way or yes, another. Yeah, it's, it's it's a journey. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, it is. is. Well, because it's one thing to give the eulogy, it's another thing to stand up and give a talk at Carnegie Hall. I mean, there are, there are levels and layers that we, that we travel as we, uh, you know, as we move yeah. through and pass our fears. There's a, there's a difference between writing in your journal 
and the writing for publication. It's, it's, it, it really is, again, the same, the same journey as we continue to move forward and upward and continue to find ways to give ourselves permission or to stop ourselves from not giving ourselves permission, perhaps, more to the point. Right, right. And I believe so, that begins with an awareness. That's so just, let's just talk, to even... Let's, okay, go ahead. I was going to say, let's talk about that awareness. And, and, and so, you know, there are people out there listening um, who mm-hmm. are in that funeral eulogy situation. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's... <laughs> Um, hopefully not literally. What's the um, what's one thing that you can tell us that that we can do um, just as a beginning to help us to move move through and past that fear, or right. to, to help okay. us give ourselves permission? Well, giving yourself permission is not as easy as saying, "Okay, I now have permission." <laughs> I wish it were so. Giving yourself permission, I think, has to do with taking a look at your audience. And there's an old saying about picture your audience naked. (laughs) Now, not only (laughs) that, I know. Well, I bring it up because I still hear it from people. And and I think that it's such baloney from my viewpoint, because I know I've been in front of audiences, I don't want to see them naked, for one thing. (laughs) I think that would please me up more than anything else, but that's just me. (laughs) Yeah, but the thing is, that that is giving you a status that is different than your audience. Mm -hmm. That's giving you a status that's above your audience. See, I'm smart enough to put clothes on. You guys are so... (laughs) dumb that you are sitting there in the air conditioning with no clothes on. And that is not what this is about at all. So I would begin with knowing that your audience, number one, is so incredibly grateful that you are the person speaking and not them. (laughs) They are. Grief, I'm so glad it wasn't me that was picked to do this. So they're really grateful that you are the one up there speaking. They are also rooting for you. They don't want you to be bad. That audience wants you to be absolutely terrific. They are cheering you on every second, even if your nemesis is in the audience. It's so uncomfortable to be in an audience when someone is bombing. It's very uncomfortable for the person presenting, but it's just as painful, I believe, for the audience member who who really wants you to do well and then sees that person up there struggling. So I think that's the first step. Look at your audience as a whole room full of cheerleaders. They want so you to win. I think that's so key because I think a lot of us go into those situations assuming that that um, you know our audience or our readers are looking for ways to cut us down. <laughs> that's what we think, and and that's exactly. what I call the nasty exactly. the nasty little kid. The nasty little kid is telling you, "Uh, uh-uh, you're going to be judged by this. You better watch it." Well, the nasty little kid tells you nothing but lies. It's, again, that's so interesting. One of the, you know, I, I resisted create, creative writing and creativity for many, many, many years. And one of my kind of caricatured images of a creative writing class was that you got up, you read what you wrote, they took out the machine gun, <laughs> and, they, and they gunned you down, and, they, and then they left you in a pool of blood. Oh. And of course, that isn't, that's, that's a caricature, which means it probably does happen now and again, but that isn't, that isn't the, 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 you know, the, the larger truth. And it took me a long right. time to get to a place where not only I could believe differently, but that I could create uh, you know, a class or a workshop that was different. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I, mean, I think, I think mm-hmm. judgment, um, whatever we're doing out in the world, whether we're sitting down at a blank page or we're getting up in front of a full auditorium, 
I think our fear of being judged just goes back to what you were talking about before, but vulnerability is really, really big. Yes. Yeah, and, and let's take that a step further in that we do judge people. It's just a human quality. Within three to ten seconds of you standing in front of the podium, people are going to make a judgment about you. And you will either support that judgment or you will negate that judgment by what you say. And hopefully you you're really... Pardon? Or how you stand or how you walk oh, out there. Oh, absolutely. Oh, my gosh. That, that is a huge part of what I work on with people. A huge part. Because how you stand, in that, that first three to ten seconds, when people are making a judgment, you may not have opened your mouth yet. Exactly. So all they have is what they see. And if they see somebody who's hunched over, whose eyes are kind of hooded, who's yawning <laughs> or, <laughs> quaking, or quaking in their boots, that's, I'm going to turn off. Personally, I'm going to say, okay, what did I bring to read? Right. But oh, it, where's, my, it, where's, where's my where's my iPhone? So. Where's my iPhone? Yeah, which is totally rude. So I would read something instead. <laughs> but, so okay, I'm standing okay. in the I'm stand, standing in the wings. My audience yeah. is out there. Yep. What? How how do I stand? How do I walk? What can I be doing for those first few seconds before I even open my mouth? To first, what can I do before I take the first step? And then what can I do as I walk out there to put that audience at ease and to put myself at ease? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, you just asked for a lot of different things. <laughs> okay. And that's great. That's great. What I want people to understand is that when you are working on these techniques, you take one small thing at a time because that's all your brain can handle. But we attack one small thing at a time. So let's first of all talk about just simply standing in the wings. And you begin to feel, oh my gosh, I wish I was the guy in the casket. (laughs) So what you want to do is just take a look at that. Just look right at that fear. And... With enough practice, when you look at that fear, it just dissipates. Because there's a part of you that knows how silly that is. Then, you have a power center. Everybody has a power center. It's in your pelvic region. And for those of you listening, if you've never explored this power center do it, do it, do it. <laughs> Email me and I will send you a video about it because this power I will, center... I, I will include that okay. information at, at, at the end of the show. Just, 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 yeah. you know, just yeah. everyone knows that. Right. Well, it's, it's when, when I don't have the visual, it's a little... It's harder to explain it. So I, I would love... I'm happy to send people a video. But that place that even a small child knows that they have, just... Drop your thinking to your pelvic region. And and it, it actually makes me giggle a little bit when I get there because it just feels so good and so powerful. And just focus on that. And it may even change your posture a bit when you find that power center. So when it begins to change your posture, really feel your feet on the floor. Actively press your feet into the floor. And this even changes your body alignment more. Still feeling that power in your center. Broaden your collarbones a bit. You want to think of, you're going to be looking at the audience. So you want to think of your face starting a little bit below your collarbone so that all from there on up through the top of your head is open to the audience. 
So broaden your collarbones and then bring your head back on top of your body, which means your earlobes are over your shoulders. And in this shift of your body alignment, you're going to begin to feel very different. You're going to feel that power. And you can keep your brain very busy doing this. That's part of part of what you're doing is keeping that left critical brain busy so that it can't get in there and mess with you. The other part of this is to physically go to where your power is, to align your body powerfully, even if you're not feeling all that powerful. When you do it physically, your brain says, oh, yeah, that feels good. I guess I am powerful. Yeah. So that is what I would suggest for the wings. And if you get through a cycle and you're feeling the power, start again right away. Do not so let that left critical brain jump in. Those are great. I mean, I remember when I was living in Hawaii, and of course, footwear in Hawaii are flip flops, pretty much anywhere mm-hmm. and everywhere. And when I would <laughs> teach um, or speak, I would take my shoes off and just walk barefoot, partly for the reasons that you're describing, because I wanted to feel that connection, that grounded connection, and it always it always gave me more. In fact, I'm doing it right now. I took my shoes off. So, so um, yeah, I'm barefoot too. I, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. there you go. Uh huh. Um, it's fun. I remember this goes back many years uh, before Anne Murray was a big success. I was living in Montreal, and I was probably in my teens, and there was this um, big Canadian content concert at Place des Arts, the big concert hall in Montreal, and one of the performers was a slightly known Anne Murray. I think she had an album or two out. And I remember she came out, and the first thing, and she would never do this now, I'm sure, but the first thing she did was she kicked off her shoes. Uh-huh. And then, uh-huh. And, and then she started to sing. So, again... It speaks to the, not only that the informality of that, which is kind of fun, but the, uh-huh. the 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 grounding into your body and into the you know that is that is really so important in what you're right. saying. Well, I will actually do that on a gig too when I'm singing because I come out in heels and the whole bit, and about the third song I say, "My feet hurt and they're coming off." <laughs> and it's like the audience so, laughs. And I'm so much more human. Exactly, exactly. Yes. Speaking of you being human, we'll we'll come back and talk about some practical stuff again in a a bit, but but I want Mm -hmm. to talk about you for a little bit um, because I know from your webinars that um, you weren't always the uh, (laughs) self-assured, self-possessed, confident speaker and performer that you come across as both in your work and, and today on the show. So why, talk, about, talk about the old Sally and how, and how you got to this Sally. Oh, I was afraid you'd take me here. It's, 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 <laughs> it's fun. It's my it's job. Absol- because <laughs> it's, it's the absolute truth that, <laughs> all right, many, many years ago, I was Sally Morgan from IndyCat, New York. And that's the way we talk in IndyCat, New York. (laughs) I told the story, absolutely true and horribly embarrassing, of many years ago, single mom, out of work, with uh, um, my boyfriend who I was madly in love with. He suggested that we go to a networking event. I didn't know what a networking event was, but he suggested it, so I thought I'd go. <laughs> and, in, and then I, I, I got the point. Everybody was getting to know each other, etc. And I spied a man in the room that I knew to be very powerful in the community. This was a small town. And he was a distant friend of my parents, so I thought, okay, somebody I know, I can go talk to him. And he asked me why I was there and told him that I was looking for work, etc. And even though <laughs> I had a lot of skills, I had a degree, um, I, I knew what I was doing, he asked me what I wanted to do, and I said, 
Well, I like to work with people. And I glanced over at my boyfriend. He rolled his eyes and walked away. That was basically at the end of that relationship. <laughs> because I was so inept at saying what I wanted and needed. And I went home from that event with no boyfriend and no job. I had, The confidence wasn't there. It wasn't there at all. So I had to go from that point to where I am now. And it, it's been a long journey. And it was a very painful journey. Obviously, that first smack in the face at this networking <laughs> event was only the beginning <laughs> of, of the painful things that I went through. But thankfully, I, I believe that people like me who have to go on those amazingly difficult journeys to find that confidence and that power have done that so that we can develop a program or a technique, a step-by-step to help other people so that they don't have to go through the same years of pain that we did. So good comes out of it. And of course. I I also say this because I know how frightened people are of speaking in public. And I just want to reassure you that if I can do it, you can do it. And when you get to the point where you do have all these marvelous techniques, one of which I talked about the waiting to, in the wings to go out on stage, when you have all these techniques in your back pocket, it's just plain fun to get out there and talk. I'm having a blast right now. This is, it's this true. Is, yeah. And, and my, my adrenaline level is a little high, but that's good because it makes me a better speaker at this point. It doesn't short out my brain. I don't shake. I am able to use that adrenaline and to tap into my power and my creativity and let it fly. It's possible for everyone. Absolutely. And one of the things that I I wrote about in, in in a book of mine a while back called The Book of Messages was that very often our area of greatest self-consciousness ends up being our area of greatest strength. And I know that's certainly been true mm-hmm. for me because mm-hmm. speaking was something, my voice was something I was always very self-conscious about. Writing, don't even get me started on that. And these are the things that now define my life and I can't imagine not doing them because I, gain, I get so much pleasure out of them. Um, and I was so, so scared and scared. I was so scared. I didn't know. I didn't even know I was scared. I just, you know, I made the sound of the cross. I backed away very quickly. So, so I do understand what you're saying. And certainly, I think that background um, has made me not only a more compassionate teacher and coach and speaker, but I think a better one because, as you say, I have a sense of what the people who are coming to me are going through. Because because yes. I've been there, and and, I, and that's very much your story as well. Yes, yes. One of the things you yeah. talk about, um, or have talked about, is how men and women use their voices differently. And I thought that very fascinating. Can you share a bit about that? Sure, sure. It comes from how we are acculturated, how we're raised. Now, I am of an age that the things my mother taught me when I was a child, how to make a bed, how to iron a man's shirt, how to make banana bread, how to set a table properly. These are the things I was taught. And I was also taught that I had to be very, very careful what I said 
mm-hmm. because it had to be pleasing to a man. And, of course, now I would have some very choice words for my mother on that, but thank goodness she has gone on to the other side. <laughs> and you would speak to them with, them with a very, very powerful place as well. <laughs> yes, yes, because she she was raised that way. And she was not raised to be powerful. She was raised to be submissive. She was, and and not in a bad way. My parents had a wonderful marriage because each of them had a very, very clearly defined role. And they never stepped outside their roles. And it worked. But when I hear women speaking, and a lot of my clients are like this, I'll do a little introduction just to demonstrate Hi, I'm Sally Morgan. My website is vocalpowertools.com. I'm so glad to have you here. So that each statement becomes a question. Is it all right with you if I'm Sally Morgan? <laughs> it's the message. Yeah. Now, men do this too, but it's very, very predominant in women. And then they wonder why in a meeting no one will listen to them. If you're constantly asking questions but you're delivering very high-powered content, the power of the content is lost. It's almost as if you're asking permission to be there with everything you're you're saying. Uh Yeah, yes. I I think that's really astute of you, yes. And in essence, we don't need anyone's permission. But if we bring that up from our depths and say, ooh, well, maybe I was asking for permission, you can, you can let that go. You can let go of asking questions and begin making true statements. Now, those of you women who are listening and saying, ah, I would never do that. Record yourself. <laughs> and that's all yeah, I have to I think say. It's, and, I, and again, I think, I, think, I think it's true for women because of the culture, and I think it's certainly true for some men, too, because certainly it has been true for me over time. So yes. I, do, I do get that. Yes. Well, okay. and, Go ahead. Yeah, and, and women do all, they also do this. You can, you can watch a, a group of very powerful women talking to each other, a man enters, and they all start talking like this and giggling. Mm. It's very interesting. And it's not that, yeah. that you have to change that. Just notice it. And you're probably yeah, and again, want it's a, it's a, it's a cult It's a cultural thing yeah, or it's a, a socialization thing more, yeah. more to the point. But it I isn't think. appropriate in business. It's just not appropriate right. and, and it's not even appropriate mm-hmm. in all social situations for <laughs> Exactly, exactly, yes. And I believe men go kind of the opposite way because they want to be manly, manly. And they talk, I know my brother does this. I hope you're not listening, David. But (laughs) when when he's talking about business, he'll he'll, he'll take on this really kind of tough guy voice. And the problem with that is it's fake. Right. And it comes it's across as, yeah, but it comes across <laughs> as insecure. It doesn't come right. across as manly. It comes across as insecure. And this would all refer right back to being afraid to just be yourself. Right. And to trust that. So with a man, I think that's that's the key for men and women, women, and that's the key. I think not only for speaking and singing and writing. That's 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 the key for living. Yes, yes, yeah. You can't separate any of this work out from life. You can't say, that's "Well, I'm going to talk this so way." Because it's yeah, because it's so much. It's so much 
in alignment with with with, uh, with what I believe and what I do as well. And this is why I'm so happy to have this conversation with you. Ah, this is great. <laughs> this is great. So, okay, I'm Joe anybody or Jane anybody, though I'm not going to pitch my voice for that. Um, what's the most important thing or, the, or, or just one thing that I can do right now to uh, with my voice? Um, and you can use me in any guinea pig way you like. Um, All right. No shame. So, <laughs> so whatever you want me to do, I will do. And thank God this is audio, and, uh, as you said, and not video. So go ahead. <laughs> All right. All right. Good. I've been waiting to get my hands on your voice anyway. Uh oh. <laughs> no, it's a good voice. It's a good voice. But I I'll I'll let's see if I, I've got to try to imitate this. It it's kind of stuck way down in there. Mhm. Right? And I'm sure you kind mm-hmm. of recognize that. It must be very difficult for you to speak for long periods of time because the voice the voice is trapped and yours specific and everybody's voice is trapped someplace but yours is almost trapped behind the larynx which you know you don't need to know that so this is the exercise that I'm giving you and everybody else For you, it will serve a specific purpose, and it will serve other purposes for other people. It's a universal exercise that actually I do every morning before I speak. Mm -hmm. And it is just a pure V. As if you're going to say the word vote, but you never get to the O-T-E. So it's going to sound like this. And I can, woo, you don't need to do that. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> now, hang on a sec, hang on a sec. Okay. Hang on a sec. The first thing I want you to do is to tell us your name and the name of this show. My name is Mark David Gerson, and this is the Electric News. All right, good. Now, remember, remember that body alignment that we did before we walked out onto the stage? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's get that open. Widen the collarbones. Head on top of the body. I want you to breathe right down to your power center, right down to the pelvic area. As you do so, loosen your jaw. In fact, open your mouth a little bit. And now I want you to try the. Okay, rest. You're singing it. Believe it or not, there's there's a little singing going on. What I want you to do is imitate a motorcycle. So. Kind of like that? Yes, men always do that much better than I can. Yes, yes, that, that's it. <laughs> It's a, it's a motorcycle, Gene. Oh, okay. Yeah, it must be. All right, so let's go again. <laughs> All right, good. Now, I want you to take a free hand and put your fingertips along the ridge of your cheekbone. Okay. All righty. Now, get that breath that goes all the way down to your power center. Open your mouth as you do so. And now I want you to do the V again. Good. Now leave your hand right where it is and introduce yourself again, please. My name is Mark David Gerson, and this is the Electric News. Did you hear it? I heard it. And I felt the vibration in my cheekbones. It was kind of nifty, too. Yes. Yes, that's resonance. That's your sound vibration. So basically what I did in that, what, minute and a half, two minutes, is to, we realigned your body. 
Because when you're speaking, that's your instrument. So you need to treat it like an instrument. If you fold it over, it <laughs> cannot function. So you want that be, that body to be nice and open and strong. And then we got you to inhale down to your power center in your pelvic region, which is where those marvelous muscles are that help you to move breath through your vocal system. And doing the V, the V is a total coordination of the proper muscles to produce sound. But we had to get you inhaling right. We had to drop that jaw open so you had no tension there. And again, drop it to the power center where you have those muscles. And then what I did was added touching your fingertips to the ridge of your cheekbone. This is one of these magic tricks that I have no idea why it works, but it does, so I do it. (laughs) And that encouraged your stuck voice to move along a different path, a path that's very free. And that's why you got a very different vocal quality when you introduced yourself the second time. That's what I do. So, and that's awesome. I mean, I, I remember I didn't I didn't do the V right on the webinar because I was doing a singy more thing. But I, even then, when I when I was listening to your webinar and did that little V exercise, I did even then notice a difference after afterwards. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I remember some years back I went to I, I, I did a um, voice class for actors back in Toronto, and one of the things that always stuck with me and this goes back to something you said a few moments ago was the instructor who's one of the uh, one of the most respected vocal coaches in Canada said Have you ever watched an animal yawn and see how wide and open and free that mouth is and how the tongue just goes right out? He said I want you to do that. <laughs> Yes, and yeah. because it really it opens your jaw, and, and that was and that's something that I that I still remember and I still do sometimes because I, I I can feel the difference after I've done it. Exactly, and and again I could tell you all the technicalities of that and the, the physiology, but I don't need to because yes, yawning. Well, when you yawn, it's your body saying, "Okay, folks, I need a lot of ox- oxygen, and I need it right now." But we cycle so our yawns, don't we? We do. As a rule. Well, that's, that's, that's very interesting because we do. We stifle our yawns because we think they're rude. And it's not that your date is boring. It's just that you need more oxygen. Right. That's all it is. And, of course, if, and you, if, if you stifle it, you're not getting the oxygen. And apparently... Animals know this very well because, boy, do they, do they not stifle their yawns. I mean, they're right. almost full-body yawns the way they open, the way they open their mouths and, and, and uncurl their tongues or curl their tongues. Yes, 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 yes. They, do, they, they, they know what they need and they let it happen. It's an instinct. And right. we as human beings say, oh, that's an impolite instinct. <laughs> <laughs> We do, we do. So if voice is such an integral part of who we are, it's, it's how most of us communicate unless we have a physical issue, um, what is it saying about us and about who we are and how we live when we don't let that voice through, which most of us don't? Fear. That's the only word that comes up for me, is fear. Mm-hmm. And how, and this is, this is another deep question, I guess. Um, once, well, let me ask you more, pra- more practically, when you watch your students and your clients and they move past at least some of that fear and they begin to use their voice in that natural way that was stifled so long ago, what do you notice or what do they tell you about how their lives change? Oh, that's so interesting. What a great question. 
I hear all sorts of different things because people come to me with all sorts of different challenges. The main thing that I hear is I feel empowered. Mm-hmm. And boy, my husband may not like this. <laughs> And that has happened too. And I do I do counsel my clients that when you change how you speak and how you present yourself, the people that are closest to you may look at you like you're an alien. Who is this woman and what did you do with my wife? Mm-hmm. And yet... I have not heard anybody come back and say, you know, my husband really hates this. You've got to undo all this work we've done. <laughs> Make me scared again. Right. Because as much as he may have loved your little girl voice, you can revert back to that when it's necessary or when it's called <laughs> for. Power in another person is always respected. It's, yes, maybe a spouse is going to say, oh, come on, is that really you? Yeah, it is. It's really you. And you deserve that power. The changes in people's lives, not being afraid of speaking in public, I have seen careers take off. I mean, (laughs) really take off. Somebody who was just terrified to speak in public, knew she needed to get her career to the next level. We worked together. She did a very small interview with someone, not in front of a camera or for the radio, but just, I think it was a, was a, a newspaper interview. She did this interview. The interviewer, immediately said, we have to have you on our television program. And it went from there. And this woman's career wow. just took off. And she's looking at me saying, but I don't even, what? I don't know how to do this. Well, yes, you do. You just <laughs> learned how to do that. <laughs> so it took or a little more to the time. point, unlearned what, you, unlearned what you had learned so you could do it. I think it's probably even more That's accurate, right. isn't it? That's it, absolutely. I'm glad you said that because we're all born with it. It's all there when we're born. It's just trained out of us for some reason. Children be, should be seen and not heard. Once From again, I'm, I'm, I'm just. Once again, I'm just so. Um, I don't even know what the what what the word is. Um, Amazed, not really, um, that everything that you say about voice, without exception, um, applies equally to our creativity, however we express Mm -hmm. that. A lot of my listeners are writers, but not all of them. Uh, And, of course, to every aspect of our lives, because if we feel more empowered because we have owned our voice, however you define voice, Mm -hmm. then whether or not we get up and do that eulogy, something in our lives has changed Mm -hmm. and can't be unchanged. You can't can't reclaim the fear. You know, it's gone now. Yes, yes. And and people do get frightened of that. There's no doubt about it. Of course. I mean... That's that's a fear you can handle. Well, yes, and of course, you know... um, as we said earlier, you know, you move from level to level and just because I'm not afraid of this anymore doesn't mean I'm not afraid of something three steps up or four steps up or ten steps up. Right. And we'll then need to address it then so I can get to another another level on that, on that staircase. Mm-hmm. Well, and if you so, have the techniques, if you have the techniques to to monitor that that fear, you can ta- use those as you move forward and forward and, and get into, you up-level it every time and there's a little bit more fear. Do you have those same techniques? You can use them. So who 
or what are your inspirations in, in your work, in, uh, in your voice work, and just generally in your life? Oh, wow. Hmm. Well, I would say that this is going to sound a little egotistical. I actually look to myself a lot for how far I have come. And it's not it's not egotistical. It's it's really that's me? This is me? When I look back at where I came from. And I think that's so key. Um and we don't tend to do that. Um I think that it's so important to recognize the progress that we've made because we, we Sometimes it's so incremental that we don't even notice it as it's happening. But if we do look back yeah. a week, a month, six months, six years, in some cases six decades, we do see a progression. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that. And, and yes, absolutely, mm-hmm. to be inspired by it. I never, I never pat myself on the back for it and say, oh, you did such a great job. I'm constantly in awe mm-hmm. <laughs> that it was even possible. No, I, I, I get that. Absolutely. So in, in, in many ways, and we've, we've touched on this throughout, throughout the program, which, alas, is starting to come close to being over. I'm, a, I'm really sorry to say you I'm having oh, a laugh. Oh, dear. Um, in a sense, voice is voice is voice. And whether it's physical voice that we've been talking about today or creative voice on the page or on the canvas, um, it really is all the same thing, isn't it? Yes, so I believe what it is. Can what for those for those um listeners who may be writers or other kinds of creative artists who maybe don't need to to speak in public or that isn't really you know the trajectory of their particular career, what can you say about voice to them about working with their physical voice to them that will feed in to the vo- their creative voice in their in, in, in the rest of their lives? Great question. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> I just had an image when you were asking me this question of a of someone who's painting, painting in broad brush strokes and and yeah, as they're painting that broad <laughs> brush stroke, adding sound to it can free up the physical. It would be so much fun, and I've done this with children to to paint the song or to paint hmm. the lyric, not with words, but with broad brush strokes. I think that that voice, the physical voice added to the artistic voice is incredibly powerful. For the writer, well, and for everyone, I keep talking about this power center. (laughs) But that is, it's key to unleashing the creativity. And if you just take one moment to sink down into your pelvic region and, and find that spark, it's just an energy. Begin by just finding that spark of energy. Feel it. And then let it go. And as you do that time and again, you'll start to... (laughs) Your ideas will start to change and broaden. One thing that I love to do myself is when I practice my singing, it's a different part of my brain so I keep a notebook nearby because as I'm practicing my singing all these business ideas come out and I just write them down I don't even listen to them I just write them down so any form of vocalization like that can free up your creativity (laughs) 